Hey, welcome along to our show. And today, I'm happy to say uh, my guest is the author of uh, a couple of my favorite books of recent years, uh, The Morality of Laughter. And uh, he followed that uh, a couple of years ago with a book called The Once and Future King, The Rise of Crown Government in America. Uh, he's also written a book called uh, The Way Back, Restoring the Promise of America. F.H. Buckley is with us. And Frank, before we get to those books um, specifically, uh, let's, uh, let's, let's talk some grubby politics. Because mm -hmm. uh, you were close to the uh, Trump campaign. You did some speech writing for right. uh, Trump uh, family members. Uh, how are things going? Uh, I think things are going more or less okay. I think they're actually mm. going quite quite splendidly, actually. Mm. But it's the case that there's a bit of a learning curve, mm. and things that I think are really important have been pushed back a bit while other things come to the fore. Yeah. Uh, for example, there was a rollout, of course, of a planned ban of Muslim migrants, and alas, that had the consequence of pushing reform of the 1965 Immigration Act uh, onto the back burner. Right. So uh, there, there were a few miscues, but in general, the wonderful thing is the energy and the determination of the Trump team, and that's exactly what was needed. You mentioned that 1965 Immigration Act. Uh, so you're a kind of purist uh, on that because uh, I'm Canadian on that. Well, actually. well, the well, I guess that's purist. Right? <laughs> well, but most people talk. Well, I'm not anti-immigrant. I'm just anti-undocumented right. immigrant. We are a nation of immigrants, and right. I love immigrants, and uh, and we celebrate immigrants, but we just don't want these undocumented immigrants. But you're actually saying. Uh, the 1965 Immigration Act is a stinker, and that needs it to... It is a complete stinker. Mm. Uh, that which went before mm. was better, and what is better still is the Canadian system, mm. which is a very complicated thing, and indeed, very few Canadians understand it yeah. terribly well. You mean by which uh, there are points that uh, an immigrant has to... Right, uh, but satisfy. The, the trick about the point system is it's not just the point system, it's mm. the constant tweaking that goes on. It yeah. was tweaked well in the Harper years, and right. now it is not tweaked so well uh, in, in, in the Trudeau years. Uh, it's, a, it's a very complicated piece of machinery, mm. and, and, and nobody much knows how it came about, uh, except me, actually. <laughs> and how did it come about? Well, you see, the Minister of Immigration in Deef's time was a lady called Ellen Fairclough, and mm. she was so obsessed with bringing in only the proper Anglo immigrants right. that immigration actually declined in her years, 57, 58, right. and thereabouts, right. until uh, a premier visited her and said, look, this is not going to work. You know, it's, it's not just going to be about bringing in, you know, the Anglos. And right. The premier's name, by the way, was Maurice de Plessis. Right. And that's what gave us the point system. Right, right. So they're, they're actually quite cunning about it. Let's, let's, let's talk about what that, that means, because back in those days, uh, and we are going back half a century now, every country thought it entirely normal that it had the right to determine who other than its own citizens entered its borders. And uh, most countries uh, took it as read that uh, certain immigrants were more compatible than others. Mm -hmm. uh, now if you say that, you're a racist and a hater. Which seems strange to me because I am a dual, mm. as perhaps you are, and I am a Canadian immigrant to the United mm. States. And mm. the suggestion that uh, you know, a Somali, a Canadian, mm. both can move to the United States and could integrate equally into that country strikes me as quite absurd. Uh, why, why does a, a statement uh, as apparently uh, unobjectionable as that cause the left to fly into... Uh, the, the left actually takes the position that a, a Somali uh, can integrate into a Western society as easily as a Swede. Because there's something behind that, that particular objection, and here's what it is. It's about what American nationalism is all about. Mm. American nationalism is not about a creed, it's not about a color, and mm. it's, it's not about a literature. Mm. 
Rather, it's about uh, a dedication to certain sacred texts, mm. amongst them notably the Declaration, the Constitution, mm. speeches by Lincoln, and adherence to those texts and those values is mm. what makes one an American, which is, by the way, the point of, of uh, that great movie, The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, right? right? I mean, right. If, if, you know, w that which made a Swede an American is, by gosh, she could recite Lincoln, right, or the Declaration yeah. or whatever, yeah. and that, that was a very stunning moment, so therefore, if that which makes you an American is an allegiance to those principles, why all you need is that and not a culture. But that said, adherence to those principles is disputed by many people, uh, many mm. Americans. Yeah, yeah. Let me, let, me, uh, let me ask you about that in uh, relation to your book, The Once and mm. Future King, The Rise of Crown Government in uh, America. Because uh, at a certain level, uh, particularly if you look at it from around the, the British Commonwealth, uh, the, the United States uh, is part, as Churchill saw it, of the English community mm -hmm. of nations. So it belongs in the same family as Canada mm -hmm. and New Zealand right. and, uh, and so on, even though it seceded mm -hmm. uh, from that family, even though it's the prodigal son. And um, um, uh, Americans... Uh, don't I think generally share that view of it? I think they, I think they, they think there is something that is sort of exceptional that was born fully formed uh, on July fourth, seventeen seventy six. They they dissent from that idea to some degree. Right. And the Canadians, of course, were the good cousins mm -hmm. who, who um, achieved independence in another way. I mean, uh, the, the thing I loved, I, 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 I've written really three books recently, yeah, yeah. all of which in praise of Canada. I mean, yeah. apart from the two you mentioned, I edited a series of essays for Yale right. uh, on, on roughly the rule of law. Yeah. And in all cases, I said the Canadians got it right, but particularly with respect to their constitution, which mm -hmm. is sometimes called the Westminster Constitution, but I think more properly is an Anglo-Canadian constitution, parliamentary government, because what the Canadians showed was that a constitution which grew up organically in one country um, over centuries could be exported to another country vastly different in terms of geography, religion, mm -hmm. culture, language, and all of that. So it, the crucial insight was that it could be exported uh, from Westminster to Canada and that Canada could accede to independence uh, gradually through peaceful means, uh, free riding all the way as long as it could. I mean, yeah. that's a great Canadian secret. Um, and that model, uh, the Anglo-Canadian model, mm -hmm. was thereafter s exported to 50 different countries with a right. combined population of 2 billion people, right. which is no small thing. And these are countries which by and large are considerably more free than those sorry countries which adopted the American presidential system. People think in America that they are free because of their constitution, whereas they are free in spite of their constitution. That's actually a fascinating and controversial thing. And you, you know as well as I do that there are figures on the American right, like uh, Mark Levin, who proudly describe themselves as constitutional conservatives. And, and in a well, sense- there is a reason for that, mm. ignorance. That's, the, that, that, that's your right. view. I mean, what's, just to explore that point, I had a fascinating I had what I thought was one of the cutest emails I've ever received uh, around the time uh, that Iraq adopted a new constitution mm -hmm. uh, in 2004, whatever it was, from a retired uh, Welsh civil servant who began his email, having written uh, the constitutions of three independent countries, <laughs> which means he was a low level uh, you know, colonial office civil right. servant at Lancaster House who whenever, it, you know, when, right. uh, uh, when Botswana or whoever it was became independent, he was the guy who was assigned. And what's interesting about, as you say, the 1867 British North America Act, which right. is Canada's constitution, and you go all the way up to Belize's or Tuvalu's mm -hmm. or the Solomon Islands in, uh, in the 80s, right. 1980s, uh, for like 130 years, the wording of those constitutions is almost identical, yeah. which is amazing. Right, I know. Uh, and the fathers were absolutely wonderful people. I mean, another difference between the countries is uh, mm. our country was created by our country, Canada rather, mm. was created by 19th century people. 
mm. who liked drinking champagne and who read The Economist and went to wonderful balls mm. in, in Quebec City, mm. whereas the American Constitution was crafted by these 18th century figures. They were right. actually more interesting than that. But, but as opposed to people who imagine their framers being demigods at a dais, right. we have these very, very human people. And right. uh, we have a constitution more suited for human beings as a consequence, I think. One that works well. One that has a reverse gear and one that doesn't make a godlike figure of the chief executive. No, and that's um, interesting to me. Again, to go back to your, your book. Um, the, the, the once and future king. Um, j j just as a kind of general observation, is, is monarchy uh, the natural condition of government, as it were, the default Well, setting? I think there's something uh, quite brilliant about constitutional monarchy, and what it is is what I call Jack Spratt's law, namely mm -hmm. the separation of head of government and head of state. Right. So in America, it is almost a constitutional duty to revere the president. Yeah. Pascal said that one has a God-shaped hole in one's heart, but for Americans, it's a Reagan-shaped hole or an Obama-shaped hole, uh -huh. and that's fundamentally dangerous to liberty. Uh -huh. I mean, the one thing about, uh, about the royals is, uh, you know, they, they may be, you know, jug-eared princes who talk to plants, but they're not uh -huh. going to audit you. Right. And for Canada, it's better still than England because they only come over once a week, once a year, right? I mean, what could be yeah. better? They don't yeah. get in the way. No, no, I think there's a lot. I, I, mean, I mean, Canada's got it exactly right. No court circular. No, there was a, well, there was a French writer who once uh, said that the great genius of, uh, of England was to have centralized power in the paradoxical absence of power, which right. means uh, the queen wields all executive power. Right but cannot use it. And in a sense, what uh, you know, Canada and Australia have done is taken it to the next level by centralizing power in the literal absence of power. I know. Uh, you know, to someone who lives on the other side of the ocean and swings by right. uh, for a Canada Day citizenship ceremony yeah, right. once Hold off there, I'm still a monarchist. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Not so fast. No, 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 that's, that's but, I, but I'm, but, uh, but, but, there is a, but there is a kind of genius in it. Yeah, there is, there? actually. Yeah. And, and, and you know who figured it all out? That even before Walter Badgett hmm. was Sir John A. John, Sir John A. came to Charlatan hmm. with a copy of Madison's Notes of the Framers' Debate under his arm. And he said, this is the most brilliant you know, piece of writing ever struck off from the hand of man, yeah. but I can do better. And right. what he meant was they have a problem with gridlock and they have a problem with the tendency towards excessive executive power. Right. Right. And I'll give you something that'll take care of that, and he did. Now, when you say the once and, and future king, though, uh, and again, it's, it's a paradox, that if you attempt yeah. to replace a monarch, and particularly if you attempt to replace a constitutional monarch, um, you, t you end up with a monarch called something else. You end up with a monarch called a president, right. as they have in France. You wind up with a banana republic in which the president wields all the power and no one except his cronies matters. You sometimes wind up with a her hereditary monarchy as they have in Syria and North Korea. Um, and it doesn't really make any difference that you call the guy president because it's, uh, I mean, they're basic, well, Kim, Kim Jong-un just had his uh, half-brother bumped off. It was a family squabble. Uh, fa you know, the, the kind of uh, inter-Nissan uh, feud. Happens in all the families. Yeah, and I'm sure in the House of Windsor there'd be right. people who'd like to, to do that too. Where does, where does, in the second decade of the 21st century, where does the American presidency stand in relation to all these monarchical presidencies then? Well, first of all, it, you know, it really doesn't work if you have a, a made-up president as they do in Germany whom nobody pays attention to. Right. I mean, it, you know, uh, David Johnson, the governor general here, is yeah. a splendid fellow. He, I actually used to co-teach a course with him at McGill in corporate yeah. finance. Good, good, good egg. Yeah. Um, but what's crucial is behind it is, in fact, the monarchy. Yeah. Now, you have this emotional desire for some attachment to something glorious above oneself. Yeah. And that's supplied in some way by the House of Windsor. Um, 
And there's a natural desire for something like that in America, and uh, alas, that's provided by their president, and that's what's dangerous about it. Mm -hmm. And of course, in the Obama years, we had also this as well. We had a Tea Party Congress elected in 2010, a Tea Party Congress elected in 2014, right. and then because of separation of powers, you know, nothing happened. Yeah. And, and so that led to incredible frustration, and it led to the presidency of Donald Trump. You know the line about how the Americans always, you know, do the right thing, but they uh, only after they've, they've, they've tried everything yeah, right. else, and that's kind of like Donald Trump. Right, right, yeah. right. Which is, uh, y your view is that uh, the, the, the framers uh, intended a weak president and a, uh, a Congress and a Congress that had more uh, of a parliamentary uh, power. They wanted something close to what Madison had proposed, which was a system mm. of filtration. Madison thought that the ordinary populace might elect the House of Representatives, mm. but the House would then elect the Senate, and the two of them would elect the President. Mm. And in fact, Madison got exactly what he wanted right. in Canada. So right. if you call him the father of a constitution, just be clear which country you're talking about, <laughs> right? Uh, but I mean, it's terribly complicated because there were all of these other things that happened thereafter, the rise right, of right. democracy, the press, and all that. And what you ended up with was basically the one figure elected by all of the people commanding yeah. the allegiance of absolutely everyone staring down a Speaker of the House from some place in Wisconsin you've never heard of, and it's simply no contest. Right, right. Whereas, what you, as you say, in the Commonwealth, uh, in Papua New Guinea, where the Parliament elects the Queen's Viceroy, is right. actually closer to what Madison had in mind. Right, yeah. Well, yeah. actually, Madison didn't believe, sadly, in monarchy. Not everyone's <laughs> perfect, but, but, you know, but what he wanted was something like a prime ministerial system. Right, right. Right. Um, and so we got that here, and, and along the way we got a reverse gear. I mean, the, the point about all of this is that any legislature inevitably will do uh, absolutely stupid things, you know, yeah. betis, and yeah. the crucial thing is being able to reverse them afterwards. Right. And so Canadians can do that. Canadians got rid of their gun registry laws, for example. Yeah. Whereas in America, you have uh, an Obamacare that's hard to get rid of, and you have Dodd-Frank, and you have the 65 Act, and you have a tax code last yeah. updated really in 1986, and all of these are seemingly the laws of the Medes and the Persians. Right, and, and you have a situation where uh, once something has been ruled on, essentially by Anthony Kennedy at the Supreme Court right. uh, as, the, as the kind of swinger, uh, basically, it's regarded as as the word of God, and you have a situation as well where um, uh, the Constitution is so revered that it is preserved by torturing the plain meaning of its words into meaning something else, which is why yes, that, that's uh, part of that's an American tragedy. You mm. see, I said before that that which makes one an American is allegiance mm. to sacred constitutional mm. texts. Mm. But to, those ex to the extent those texts get broadened, right. if you're on the wrong side of them, you're less than American. If you're on the wrong side of Dodd-Frank, it's, it's just politics. But yeah. if you're on the wrong side of same-sex marriage, for example, yeah. Yeah. though this may be 50% of the population, you're somehow less than American. And that's dangerous because yeah. I regard nationalism uh, uh, as, as a good thing. Right, right. So and this frays the bonds of nationalism. Yeah. Yeah, and, uh, and, and, and that's slightly different from, you know, David Cameron uh, telling the members of the House of Commons uh, that they had to vote for same-sex marriage right. or the Irish holding a referendum or right. whatever. In a sense, uh, a couple of judges deciding that the founders had cannily foreseen the need for same-sex marriage right. back in the 18th century right. is it takes it to a whole other level. Well, um, you know, I, I I regard that same-sex marriage hmm. as not a non-issue, hmm. but a divisive issue, and and, and therefore hmm. a bad issue in my mind. But I do strongly believe, as Hume did, that uh, the ability of the government to improve our morals is approximately nil. Right, right. So the best thing you can do largely is get out of the way and let other institutions take care of it. Where are we, where are we going on uh, uh, the Constitution? Because the interesting thing about Donald Trump is that it's pretty clear he doesn't uh, think about it much. It's no. not a. He he will occasionally 
uh, refer to it, but he's not, as you well know, there are all kinds of uh, Republican candidates one meets stomping around in uh, New Hampshire in the snows of winter, uh, winter who, who produce from their pocket uh, a copy of the Constitution right. and claim, and Ted Cruz ran on the Constitution. Rand Paul, in an entirely different way, ran on the Constitution. Right. Trump just seems to think it's kind of not in his field of vision that much. Well, I, I, I ran a program training judges for many mm -hmm. a year, and when I heard that oh, about a year ago that Trump wanted a list of judges, mm -hmm. I wrote to uh, Senator Sessions and said, well, here's a list. And by yeah. the way, here's a speech that might accompany it. And it yeah. was a constitutional conservative speech, yeah. um, one in which uh, I will rule as a constitutional leader, right. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and uh, people like Steve Miller asked me for redrafts of that speech about five times, and it was never given. Right, right. But in the end, I said, I think that Trump would be a constitutional conservative because he's He's a bargainer. He's a, you yeah. know, he's a, as, as they say in Ireland, he's a handler. Right. Okay. Right. So, uh, <laughs> That's a good Right. He's Celtic. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know. uh, um, but, you know, he's going to be a deal maker and he's going to have to cut deals on taxes. I mean, right, the market's right. already reflected what Steve Mnuchin promises to do on taxes. I hope down the line, as does Senator uh, Attorney General Sessions, yeah. that there will be a, an immigration deal. Right. That's a real deal. Yeah. Yeah. taking care of a 65 act. So there, there's this whole legislative agenda, and that's a matter of uh, bargaining. Is, is immigration uh, at, in the year 2017 now actually an existential threat to old, settled, free societies? Uh, it may be in Europe, mm. from all one can read. It is not yet like that, I think, in Canada. Uh, you know, let, let me say this about Canada, mm. and uh, in praise of Justin Trudeau, mm. uh, when you have a very conservative society and a very conservative set of laws, which is Canada, the great secret is of Canada is how deeply conservative it is, mm. then you can afford to be generous. And frankly, I found it difficult to watch the YouTubes of Trudeau welcoming Syrian refugees 13 months ago without being moved. I mean, it was, it was, you know, it was profoundly mm -hmm. moving. One found afterwards they were all Muslims and there wasn't a Christian amongst them, but that's something else. But the yeah. point is, you know, what, one, one, one has those generous impulses. And one of the saddest things about America right now is that this, the most generous nation in the world, mm -hmm. has had all of its instincts to generosity stilled by the belief that a government is against them, that they don't trust the government. Yeah. I believe that that's a bad, libertarians think that's great, but I don't like libertarians particularly, and I think it would be a good thing if you trusted your government, because it means it's getting it right. So, but, but, you know, the point about a person like Justin is he's building upon institutions in part created by people like, you know, former liberal leaders of a more conservative hue, mm. like Paul Martin, and... Um, and that gives them the ability to do it. So I said on CTV, uh, CBC yesterday, which didn't make any friends, that, <laughs> uh, that Canada is a bit like a teenager back in the day in Mawa, New Jersey, who would hop on the bus with some freshly pressed pants by his mother that morning, right. and he'd go slumming in the village, and then he'd come back to mother at night. So we, you know, we Canadians tend to pride themselves on their little bits of uh, self-proclaimed virtue without realizing it's built on all these conservative institutions. It, look, it's got an immigration system uh. that Jeff Sessions would like. It's got yeah, a tax yeah. system that you know every conservative would like in America. No, that that that's uh, that's uh, that's certainly true, especially the corporate you know corporate tax. Uh, the, yeah. the, um, the, but but let me g go back to that point you made about uh, being. Uh, being moved and uh, generosity. Hmm. Um, what, what do you call generosity? And I think that's true. Um, but I wonder, uh, for, 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 well, for example, I wonder if that generosity is not born by a, um, out, of a, out of a misplaced sense of our own strength, as it were. Um, it, it, someone said to me uh, a, a few months ago, I, I said, why does the Prince of Wales keep talking up Islam as if it's the best? He says, you know, Islam is great stewards of the environment. I said, have you ever been to 
the average small Arab. I've been in small Arab towns in Jordan and Iraq, and they're like, you'd think there'd been a garbage strike uh, for, for the last four years. There's just mountains of rubbish everywhere. They're not stewards of the environment. And why does and, 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 uh, and the person I was talking to said, well, you forget how it looks from his point of view. Every time he goes, when, when they say, oh. oh, the Prince of Wales is going to be at morning worship this Sunday in oh. Yorkshire or wherever, and for one, and everybody, oh, the Prince of Wales, is and they're all there in church, and he arrives and right. thinks, uh, and he and thinks the Anglican Church right. is in a much stronger state right. than it is. And I wonder if that isn't actually how we, in the West, in the 21st century, are. We actually think we're in a much stronger state than we are. I mean, it's a Potemkin effect, it, to a certain degree. I don't know if that's the case. I, I think that um, we don't fully appreciate the mm. conservative institutions which make generosity possible. Mm. We're, we'd like to forget them, and there's a lot of virtue preening and all of that, isn't right. there? I mean, there's a lot of yeah. self-congratulatory hugging of oneself. And, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, uh, but are we, uh, are we very much in decline? Well, look, I have to confess, I've always thought you a bit of a giddy optimist. So. I, um, <laughs> I, I, okay. Uh, you know, okay. I, I, I do take your point. Okay, okay. Let me ask you about uh, your book, The Morality of Laughter, right. uh, which uh, is, uh, is actually a, a serious book to grapple mm, to, uh, very uh, serious to grapple with. Uh, yeah, it, its seriousness is, is, uh, is kind of slightly mm. uh, disguised. But the, uh, well, let, let me ask you a basic question. Why did you want to, why did you want to write that book? Well, one writes books largely because one wants to assemble the right kind of reading list, reading yeah. list that'll be fun. So I yeah. thought, right, well, if, you know, if I have to write a book about laughter, I have to you know, read all these great guys. Yeah. Uh, and I also read some dullards as well. I discovered that Kant told a joke once. <laughs> yes, there was a, there's such a thing as a Kantian joke. Right, right. Quite unfunny, of course, uh, but you know, I don't know if there's a Hegelian joke. But, but in any <laughs> event, you know, apart from that, one was reading good stuff. Yeah. And then when I put it together, it seemed to me that there was a distinct mess. And, and I, I really got started with Henri Bergson's Lourdes, right? Because right. Bergson is this great, great unknown liberal hero. He's just yeah. a wonderful fellow. And, um, and so I thought, well, you know, there's something going on here which is really quite interesting. What, yeah. And what was interesting what I, was, I thought, that laughter conveys a very serious message about how to live, right? Yeah. Because we're laughing at people, so it's yeah. laughing at, not with, really. Yeah. We're laughing at some butt of laughter, right. and we're instructing him how to live well. At least we're telling him, look, you know, you, you'd rather miss the point here. You right. know, you've got to do right. things a little better. Right. And, um, and of course, you know, that rubs a lot of people a long way. I mean, first of all, it's very judgmental. Yeah, right. no, no, that's true. And and of course that appealed to me, right? I mean, right. you know, this this is this is I like to laugh at people, right? right. You laugh right. to you know, right. point your finger at somebody and say, "What a buffoon!" Right? What an yeah, idiot! Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this was uh, so th so I looked at what I thought the hidden message was, yeah. and uh, it was coded with I thought all kind of information about uh, Pascal called it finesse. And yeah. Bergson had the same idea. The idea is that the butt lives life according to a geometric set of rules. Right. And what's required for life is something vastly more subtle than that. Yeah, yeah. And, and so that was why I, for example, thought that Ted Cruz was a, a complete butt. I mean, a perfect guy right. living by a set, hypocritically by a set of rules. Yeah, yeah, a geometric uh, right, candidate yes. in, in a sense. But, but Mitt Romney's 59-point plan. Yes, that, that's, that's right. But, but you know, we are living increasingly, are we not, in a, in a uh, geometric uh, world because people in Canada, people get prosecuted for jokes. In mm -hmm. America, people get Twitter shamed mm -hmm. for uh, jokes. In uh, London, uh, an Australian comedian accepting some award for a movie role made a mildly uh, funny joke about transgender people and she was assailed because the joke was totally unsupportive of transgender people in the sense that if you say why did the chicken cross the road the poultry Ob association objects because that is totally unsupportive of <laughs> the difficulties chicken have in crossing <laughs> roads 
Uh, and of course, in France, uh, if you make the wrong joke, right, they kick could. the doors open and uh, kill you, as they right. did at Charlie Hebdo. Yeah. I, and I kind of wonder whether we're meant to live geometric lives now, and that's a world without any laughs. Well, that's rather my point. I said that laughter has a distinctly conservative edge to it, mm. and of course, you're talking about a bunch of conservatives of one kind or another, mm. norm breakers who are punished for telling jokes mm. by a rather rigid Puritan left. Mm. Um, you know, kind of all the things one should naturally despise. Right, right. Yeah, all the killjoys of the world. They never go away, right? I mean, you know, you can, you know, you can be in the middle of a perfectly satisfactory yeah. orgy and then you have a couple of party poopers, right? <laughs> but, the, but, 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 but it's odd, isn't it, that the killjoys in our time, the killjoys, uh, the Puritans, the prudes, are the fellows who think they're actually the cool, groovy, cutting-edge people yeah. uh, and who are saying, oh, no, you can't say that. That's not funny. You have to lose your job for that. That's, 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 it's, it's, it's the cool kids who are, saying, who, who are saying, you can't say that. Right? Well, perhaps fascism is cool. They are the liberal fascists, right? So perhaps right. they're trying to say, you know, I guess what they're saying is not so much that we're cool as we have power. Right. We have the right. power to... Right. We have the power that comes from punishing, and we have the power, the unique power to be offended. Only we can be offended. And yeah. the power to be offended really determines politics. Right. That's why it's really important to offend. You do yeah. a good job, I think. No. <laughs> full, well, full Mark Steele. Well, and, and uh, the you know, I'm talking to the master here, by the well, way. Well, no, but the current president does. I mean, I, I, would, I felt about Trump that even if I didn't actually agree with him on a single policy, I thought it was good for the health of the republic that he could say the stuff he did in the way he did yeah. and not pay any price for it. No, in fact, well, he did pay a price with some people, but the point is the more outrageous he was, and mm -hmm. joke-telling is, what's the word, transgressive? Uh, yeah. So uh, the more he did that, the more people liked him amongst Trump supporters, yeah. such as moi. Yeah. I mean, I talked about virtue signaling a moment ago, but yeah. the opposite is what... Uh, outrageousness signaling. So <laughs> right. every time he did that, Trump supporters said, yes, he's going to do it. He's not going to back down. He's not going to be a wimp. Yeah, right? He's yeah. telling us he's tough. Yeah, yeah. And he's going to do it. And you know what was great? And he didn't apologize. After. No. I like no, that. No, no. Yeah. And that's, uh, that goes back a uh, ways too. Uh, the, oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that goes back to the 19th century. I mean, I go, you know, Wellington never worried about apologizing, no, no, for example. And, uh, that's uh, w w that's uh, Israeli's advice to uh, Queen Victoria too, as well. And, uh, and what would that be? Well, that you know, he asked inquiringly. Nev never explain. Ah, you never know. explain. Man. And I think that's. I think the minute and Trump. You know, yeah. I think that. I think that's great. It's just yeah. to to be. Uh, to just say, yeah, take it. I, I said what I said. Take it or leave it. You know, and I think that's the. I think that's the best attitude. Yeah. Well, things. That's an encouraging sign, and that I yeah. think you're you're uh, you're right on that, uh, Frank. But it would be interesting, because actually Trump's manner of uh, public discourse is uh, fascinating to me. It's a it's a whole different way of communicating, mm -hmm. and I. Uh, and at some point, there is a kind of sequel uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the gap between the once and future king and the morality of laughter. I think there's, uh, there's, there's a book that you were probably better positioned to write than anybody uh, of tr tr Trump's manner of speaking as a way of, uh, as a means of communication. So it's... Uh, well, my current project, Borrowed from Procopius, is yeah. called The Secret History. And so I'll talk about what's happened over the last year. Maybe oh, a little right. bit of that. Okay. Some of the speech writing. You know. Okay. I'll, uh, I'll look forward to that. Uh, that's, uh, that's great. And by the way, uh, American, the thing I hate about American publishers is... Um, these uh, uh, these uh, subtitles they always uh, insist on. Does the morality of laughter has a, have a subtitle? I don't think it does. No, oh, that's yeah. why I remember the title because it's like just got. Right. Where, where's the once and future well, king? It was, I had you know, a, it's it like, was ripped off by T. H. White. I mean. Yeah. No. 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 But, yeah. but you had to go the once and future king colon the rise of crown government in America, and uh, the way back colon what comes after the colon on the way back. Oh, it was something suggested by the publisher, of course. Oh. Um, 
I've even forgotten at this point. I remember restoring the promise there of you go. America. That's it. This is pathetic. You know, you have to have subtitles and books, and the author can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> But so it's got a colon in it. That's right. all you need to know when right. you look it up at Amazon. Oh, it's got a great <laughs> photograph in the front. That's great. That's true. That's true. That has a fantastic and moving photograph yeah. in the front of that book. Uh, F. H. Buckley, Frank Buckley, thanks. Thank great you so much. Thank you. That's great. And we'll see you next time.